Oh, okay. Right. Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Thank you for reminding us. So, um, here's a photo of the club walk in the early years, and you can see Mary Worrell there and David Porter there. But right out front here, you can see our senior advisor, Suzanne Reef. So this is back, I think in 2004, so 17 years ago. And here's Suzanne 17 years later, <laughs> still working the ID tables. And, um, you know, oh, um, is that Virginia? Taylor, yeah. it, could, we're just going to mute you. So that it was a great laugh, but I got you muted. Um, so, you know, this was, and, and Virginia that was on, this was one of her first walks and it was a great time. And you can see from the attire that it rained most of the time we were out in the woods, but that if you're a mushroom hunter, that doesn't stop you. So this is a good time to introduce you to some of our current board members. So Right here, Sam and Cornelia, treasurer and president. Rod, who's our vice president, who you're gonna hear from a little later tonight. And then here's Jeanette Hansen, our secretary. And she and her husband Gallo came out to the NAMA foray. And we'll talk about NAMA in a little while, but came out to the NAMA foray in Colorado. And then they did some mushroom hunting in Colorado. And look at the size of that Amanita muscaria. And then here's Suzanne Reef, who is our senior advisor. And we do get Amanita muscaria down here, but it's usually yellow, a yellow, light orange color. Not, not that scary, but... not that beautiful red. Yeah. And uh -huh. here's here's a nice picture of um, Cornelia when we visited a John C. Campbell Folk School, which you'll be hearing more about um, a few years ago because Susan Hopkins from upstate New York was doing a mushroom dyeing workshop at the school. So we went up to visit her and she actually talked to our club and did a dyeing workshop with our club. I always like to say D-Y-E. Yes. So people know. Mushroom dyeing with an E. We're not saying D-Y-I. And here's some of the colors that she got with mushrooms and lichens. And there's a little quote from Cornelia up there, who she doesn't remember saying it, but it's good to remember it's Cornelia, not Cordelia, not Ophelia, and certainly not Margaret Cho. <laughs> and um, here's the 10 commandments of eating wild mushrooms, which is always a good thing. We talked a little bit about, but you need a positive ID. You need it mushroom in good shape, not old and full of bugs and spoiled. You need to cook them thoroughly. You need to eat moderate quantities, especially first time you're trying them. And when you've picked mushrooms and you're gonna cook some and eat some, one, only cook a little amount for the first time, but two, save some uncooked specimens on the side so that if you end up in the hospital or something, you can take them with you to help be identified. Um, and we also talked about don't, pick in contaminated areas. Um, don't assume because it's edible in some other country that the lookalike will be edible here. Um, be careful who you're serving them to, especially elderly people or children or people who have any kind of um, immune um, comp compromise. And when you try it for the first time, eat, eat a little bit but also wait 24 to 36 hours just to see how you feel. And um, don't mix up, especially in the pan, don't mix up all your different specimens. That's why when we go on walks, we always have little wax lunch bags or paper lunch bags, because you wanna keep your mushrooms separate in your basket. So this is just, a couple examples of our early um, newsletters, which we, you know, and, and notice here, 2006, here's a walk being led by Suzanne Reef, actually at the park where we just held the walk this past Sunday. 
with a name with a name change with a name change oh, okay yeah it was called bell's ferry park then you know, oh, Mary's at Bell's Ferry. Oh, okay. And then here's another newsletter and a nice Amanita here. And then um, these are two posters that our Vice President Rod made back in the early years when we were doing our in-person meetings. And, um, and Rod was actually giving this talk the biochemistry of medicinal mushrooms. And we've held our monthly meetings at quite a, a few locations around the city. It started out at the Botanical Garden where Mary Worrell works. And then we moved to the Central Congregational United Church on Claremont Road that um, David Dunnigan up there is a member of and, and helped connect us with that church. So we met there for a while. And then for about a year, a little over a year and a half, we met in the loading dock of an REI. My favorite thing is that they call it the shipwreck, like the shipping and receiving. So they call it. So we met in the shipwreck. But then they decided they weren't going to let clubs meet there anymore. So we had to find another space. And we have currently been meeting for about three to four years um, pre pandemic at the in town community church on La Vista Road. And we hope to be starting to meet there again sometime beginning next year, just depending on you know, how, how the uh, virus goes. So one of the benefits of membership is you get to participate in walks, workshops, potlucks, classes, and forays, among other things. And this was a shiitake log cultivation workshop that we did at one of our members' houses in Stone Mountain. And on the right is an oyster mushroom bag cultivation workshop that We've led a few times for our club, and the gentleman who came up with it, Milton Tam from Seattle, he actually came and talked to our club about coming up with this and did a workshop where we made bags for, it was close to 60 or 70 people. And we are actually going to be holding this, an oyster mushroom bag cultivation workshop in the next two to three weeks. So you'll be getting an email about it because you'll need to sign up. But we're going to do it in an outside pavilion, um, probably where we just had our walk at the Skip Wells Park, so that we can continue to safely meet outdoors. But this is a really fun um, technique. And you end up with mushrooms in anywhere from two and a half to four weeks. I like to call it just add water, because if you've ever had to pasteurize, pasteurize substrate, like with a giant 55 gallon drum, lots of straw, it takes hours and hours and hours. This does not, because you just add water to the stuff and mix everything together and put it in your basement or pantry. And one of the things we also do is we every year host a joint foray with Asheville Mushroom Club and the South Carolina Club, which is called SCUMS. And um, this is a poster of the very first one in 2008. So it doesn't say South Carolina Upstate Mycological Society is what they decided to call themselves. Right. And we've uh, we've done it, held it 12 times, and we skipped two years. Once was in 2015 when the Ashill Club, with our help, um, hosted the NAMA foray, which we will talk about. And then, of course, we didn't do it last year in 2020. Um, and this is Jay Justice right here. This is a picture from the account, one of the Oconee forays where we are um, around the identification tables. And I think he's talking about some of the mushrooms that we found there. And that's one of the great things about the Oconee Lake foray is we've gone every year. So we're able to keep a record of what mushrooms we have found in that area. And so each year we keep adding to that and we um, you know, find new species every year. I think the latest update from um, Charlotte, who is our recorder, was, was that um, we found 28 new species for our foray this year. And we found, um, we identified 178 new species this year. 
And that was just with um, 40, 40 of us going out and hunting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a little break here. We're gonna stop sharing the screen and Bill Sheehan, who is one of our members is gonna talk about what he um, has done and set up since, since being in the club. That's what we did, yeah. So Bill. So you ready for me to share a screen? Yep. Okay, let's see if I can get it up there. How's that? There we go. Awesome. Well, good evening, everybody. I want to tell you about an all volunteer community science nonprofit organization called the Fungal Diversity Survey. And I first got hooked on fungi eight years ago when I was getting ready to retire from running environmental nonprofits. And I hooked up with the Georgia Club, and they've been supportive ever since. Um, and in 2017, I co-founded the North American Mycoflora Project. Its aim was to mobilize amateur mycophiles to document all of the macrofungi in North America. So far, over 200 local projects have been registered. Our original emphasis was on helping amateurs get their specimens documented online and DNA sequenced or barcoded. And so far, more than 7,000 specimens have been documented and sequenced. And many of those specimens represent new undescribed species. Alan Rockefeller thinks that as many as 10 to 20% of his collections could be new to science. He's a amateur community scientist, many of you have heard of. And so you can see there's a great opportunity for amateurs here. In 2020, we ditched uh, Mycoflora and adopted a new name, Fungal Diversity Survey, or Fundus for short. And we did this to reflect the fact that fungi are not plants, they are their own kingdom. And our focus has changed from documenting everything to documenting threatened fungi, fungi and crowdsourcing the data needed to protect them. And this is based on the increasing recognition of the importance of fungi to people on the planet. There's all kinds of uh, mainstream media articles have appeared in just the last couple of years. The fact that fungi have been overlooked relative to plants and animals and the fact that fungi are threatened by the same impacts that are threatening extinction of plants and animals, like climate change, uh, pollution, habitat loss, invasive species. Uh, the difference is that with fungi, we just don't know what most of them are, unlike uh, many animals and plants. Just look at the number of species that have been evaluated for the global red list of organisms threatened with extinction. Now compare the number of animals and plants with fungi. You know, it's pathetic. So we established two programs to engage amateur mycophiles in fungal conservation. And I wanna tell you a bit about those. Uh, first, the rare fungi challenges, and second, a biodiversity database. First, we assembled a team of conservation experts and community scientists. And last October, we launched the West Coast Rare Fungi Challenge. It was initially a six month pilot project to see if we could get people to care about fungal conservation and engage in a productive manner. We chose 10 target species, all easy to identify without microscopy. And the results were promising. Despite the pandemic and a major drought on the West Coast, seven of the 10 target species were found. 
91 observations were made by 62 finders, two major range extensions and several new locations were documented. 20 vouchers were taken and sequenced for the seven species that were found. And there was a whole lot of excitement as well as increased awareness of the need for fungal conservation. So we're continuing the West Coast challenge and now we're about to launch a Northeast rare challenge in cooperation with the Northeast Mycological Federation, which goes from Quebec down to Pennsylvania. We could do more challenges in other parts of the country, uh, like the Southeast say, if we had the funding to manage them. So our second conservation program is engaging an army of amateurs to build up a database of observations that begin, can be used for fungal conservation. And we call it the Fundus Biodiversity Database. And it's really a, essentially a subset of observations posted to iNaturalist that have been vetted by experts. iNaturalist and Mushroom Observer promise to deliver a new age of community science by allowing committed amateurs to make meaningful contributions to fungi, to protecting fungi. The vast amounts of image-rich geotag distribution data posted there have the power to unlock new insights about fungi and inform environmental impact assessments. So the reason we're doing this is that we lack the for the vast majority of fungal species, the minimum information needed to predict the probability of a species going extinct. And these include information on geographic distribution, population size, change in population size over time, is it going down, uh, and information on threats and if possible solutions to mitigate them. So on the right is, is a image of bird observations and compare the 3 million fungal observations for North American, for North America, uh, North American fungi on iNaturalist with eBird, uh, whose data these are. And that's a community science app for birders. They're approaching 1 billion observations worldwide. And when you get those kinds of numbers, uh, you, can, you can analyze them scientifically. And in fact, there's been over 400 peer reviewed scientific papers published using uh, data from eBird. We need an eBird for fungi. I mean, they've only got 10,000 species. You know, we've got what, a million, 10 million? But observation quality is also critical. High quality observations are the cornerstone of science and conservation. So we at Fundus are engaging triagers to help beginners post better observations. You can't do much with photographs like you see on in the slide there. And identifiers to certify or provide fungal names for what you post. So why should you contribute? Anybody listening to this can contribute to the biodiversity database. And why should you bother? Well, for one is to get your observations identified by experts. Second, to learn how to make scientifically useful observations. Unfortunately, observations posted to Facebook and Instagram and Flickr are useless to science because they're not database and they're not geotagged. So it's critical to do those things to have scientifically useful observations. And thirdly, just to contribute to fungal conservation. I think there's a lot of people out there that, that are concerned about the future. And once they understand how important fungi are to ecosystem fun function, um, they get interested in fungal conservation. So, and this is, uh, it's not just when you're out in the woods by yourself that you can do this. With some preparation and coordination, mushroom walks and forays could be redesigned for beginner engagement and for making learning mushrooms fun and interactive, all the while contributing to fungal, fungal conservation. On the right, you see a screenshot 
of the iNaturalist project I created a couple of weeks ago at the Wild Acres Foray up in North Carolina. It's a collection project, uh, what iNat calls a collection project. So you just uh, make the boundaries that you want to uh, get observations from. And these were the collection areas for the foray. And then any fungal observations that are posted during the dates of the foray, you know, this was three or four days, are automatically added to this, uh, this project. And now per participants have a permanent record of many of the finds, most identified by experts. And it's something that they can learn from for, uh, for a long time. So that's about it. I want to thank the Mushroom Club of Georgia for supporting Fundus during the past five years and all the incredible volunteers that make Fundus so special. Let's close now. To learn more about the challenges and biodiversity database, go to our website, it's fundus.org, and subscribe to our free newsletter and blog. And that's all she wrote. Thanks, Bill. I like that you're also using the term funga, which has gotten oh, official yeah. recognition. And we had that piece in our newsletter about that. So thank you very much. Um, anyone have any particular questions for Bill at this moment? It's a great citizen science project. I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm trying to remember, but um, isn't the what what uh, organism is most populous on this planet? Um, I think I'd heard at one point in time that it was the kingdom that had uh, mushrooms in it that made up uh, the most of the planet. That it wasn't animals and plants. Yes. Well, I mean, you, you talk to people that study beetles and they'll tell you beetles. And it's nematodes, it's nematodes and fungi, uh, you know, fungi. But if you look at the diversity, it's bacteria. So it's, it's kind of hard to say. If you study the microbiome and they're, they've said that, you know, we're like the amount of human cells, to bacteria, fungi and viruses is like 100 to one, they actually are updating that. They think it's more like a thousand to one. So if that percentage of us is bacteria, then probably mm -hmm. a good percentage of other things too. Is it worth posting stuff on my naturalist when you, we can identify it ourselves? Because it's not great at predicting. Uh, yeah, what you can do is you go to when you're posting your observation, you'll see um, a list of, I don't know, about five uh, things to check. And at the bottom of those is something called projects. And you got a little carrot off to the right. And if you have, first you got to join the Fundus Biodiversity Project. And there's instructions for that on the website. It's, it's not bad, but one, once you've joined it, then that project will appear on the project list of projects you've joined. And so you can add any observation to any project that you've joined. So you've got to manually click on the fundus, by, it, it's actually on iNaturalist, it's called fundus-fungal diversity survey, but that is our biodiversity database. So you just add them to that and um, hopefully someone will come along that uh, can identify what it is. Yeah. Well, and to, to be honest, you know, what I do a lot, there's a lot to be gained from Facebook special groups. There's really great experts on Facebook. And if you go to like the Ask a My Seed or the, the Polypores or a lot of them, the Amanita group, uh, you can really get uh, very good identifications. And, but what I encourage people to do since Facebook, and you'll get more interac interaction on those Facebook groups, is I encourage people to first post it on iNaturalist and then post the link to iNaturalist in your Facebook uh, posting. 
that's another way to get good identifications. And um, I've got a question for you, Bill, but then I was gonna say for people who have further questions, um, that they just put it in the chat to Bill, because Bill's gonna actually, you're gonna be leaving kind of soon. So yep. you can just I'm, put- I'm actually it, enrolled in a slime mold class this week. So <laughs> right, that's, jump that's over. Right, going on now. But would you be able to sometime maybe do like a 15 or 20 minute tutorial on how to use iNaturalist? Sure, that's, that's a good way to do it. And Zoom is perfect because then you can just get on the website and. So you go here, you go there, you do this, you do right. that. Okay, so we might set that up as a special, you know, Sunday afternoon science meeting or something. But anyway, I just wanted to ask about that. Thank you, Bill, for taking yeah. time out of your slime mold class. Yep, and if we get further questions and you're already gone, we will, we will get them to you and then be able to share the answers with the entire club. Excellent. So if you need to go, um, yes, au revoir. If I'm done. I am going to leave you all. Okay. And, uh, thank uh, you thank very you. much for your presentation. And I'm, we're really glad that the club can support you and that you've been inspired by the club too. So definitely. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Okay, y'all. So um, what we're going to do now is Cornelia and I just taught a week long mushroom immersion class at John C. Campbell Folk School. And so Cornelia is gonna run through a short PowerPoint about that, just so you have an idea of where some of this mushroom stuff can go. And then we'll go back to talking about our club and some of the um, opportunities we have for you. Okay. Oops. You need to move that so you can. I know, got that bar at the top, and it's okay. Great. So just do slideshow, play from start. All right. So I just realized I admit that I did this for um, my fiber arts group. So. Sam's playing with the screen here. So we uh, had taught a weekend class. Actually, we were called because the person that uh, was supposed to teach the class bailed on John C. Campbell like a month before. And so our name came up as someone that could teach a class. We taught a weekend class and people that filled out the survey said, this needs to be a whole week long. So we got asked back to do this. And then, uh, let's see, oh, there's the, okay. On this, not right. Great. And so if you don't know about John C. Campbell Folk School, it's up in North Carolina, in Brasstown, North Carolina. And it was founded in 1925. And they stress teaching things that you make by hand or do, you know, with your body. And so there's blacksmithing, weaving, jewelry making, dyeing, DYE dyeing. There's weaving, there's all kinds of folk arts that they continue to promote and have classes for. And this is our class. We had a smaller class size because of COVID. A lot of the people here are wearing the scarves that they made during the class. And this is Leo Tremedes Lactinea, which actually has, was called Tremedes elegans. It's a trimitic fungus and excellent for making paper. So we did one of the activities we did, in addition to peop teaching people how to ID mushrooms, how to do spore prints, how to use keys, we did some of these also artistic pursuits. And one of the things that we figured out how to do is all these little pressed flowers, you can do them in the microwave. And instead of three to four weeks, you can have them in a few minutes, actually. So that's some yarrow leaves. And that's a decal that has a hole in the middle to make a little frame. We were able to, because they do have less classes than usual, we were able to use the paper studio, the, the wet studio, which is where weaving and dyeing take place, and then the kitchen as well. So we kind of 
were a little bit spoiled as to how much access we had to facilities. And so these are some more examples of paper in the drying rack in the paper studio. This is actually a fungus that stains wood green. And one of our friends who has presented to the club about the phenomenon of spalting is where the fungus stains the wood a color. This is called the elf cup fungus. And it's a fascinating history of how that's been used. But you can also get this wood pulp and incorporate it into the paper and have green paper. This is another fungus that we used. So some people call it dead man's foot. Some people call it dog turd fungus, but it's uh, the dyer's puffball and pisolithus. So the genus that occurs in the Southeast is the Arenarius species. and species, yeah, the species that occurs here. And you can see these little, these little things that look like little peas cut in half. Piso means pea and lithus means stone. And uh, this is actually a really cool fungus. Tom Volk has a great page on the fungus that it's actually purposely spread along with seedlings to establish uh, newer tree plantations because it's so good at helping develop mycorrhizal relationships in the soil. But the other thing it's great for is to use to dye protein fibers. It also will dye cellulose fibers too. So protein fibers are like silk and wool and cellulose would be like ramy and cotton and linen. And that's a PVC pipe where a silk scarf has been wrapped around it then tied with twine and simmered for a number of hours at 180 degrees. The, these are some of the silk scarves where they're unfurled. We were rinsing them out, untying fr from the PVC pipes and one of our members posing with them and a little bit more of a close up. So this is a technique, a shibori technique called arashi. It's meant to look kind of like a storm. And then we also dyed yarns wool yarns with Faola schwanitzii. And there's a dried Faolus, and I think that's Sam's hand with some wool. And then these are the different colors we got. The yellow one has a uh, alum mordant. No, the yellow is just straight mushroom. Oh, that was mushroom. straight? Okay, yellow one, I stand corrected. The yellow one is straight mushroom. This one is with an iron mordant ahead of time. So this, Mushroom is called the Dyer's polypore. Uh, so I had led a workshop at the Northeast Mycological Federation foray in 2012. And um, there's a little video on the Science Friday website. And so we also taught people how to do this. This is Naomi and she did this on her vest. And then another student took the stink horn that we found is an inspiration and did this on the back pocket of her jeans. And here is Jane. She decided she wanted something that she could take pictures of and then manipulate. Diane, who's a retired professor from University of Birmingham, she- Let's bring the sun down, let them see the pictures. Slow down, okay. Let them see the pictures. Let them see the pictures. All right. So she took some gloves, some wool gloves that had holes in them from moths and she decided to make a whimsical mushroom on one and then chanterelles on the other one. And this is made by Karen, who's in charge of nature studies at John C. Campbell. And she did it to commemorate the weekend. And then one of the things that they do at John C. Campbell is that you have a little display table to show what you did over the weekend that the other groups can see. And they've one of the things they figured out to do is have it in the large open air festival barn. So that was our class. And so there's are some of the mushrooms we identified and so a few of the scars we made and some of the paper up there. And oh, and we also did oyster bag workshop for them. And I had done some oyster bags about a month beforehand so that they were fruiting while we were there. So we got to, um, I also did cooking demonstrations. 
Right. And so I think we cooked morels, chanterelles. We made chanterelle peach jam. We cooked the maitake and the chicken that Eleanor had sent us. Black trumpets. And black trumpets. And, and oysters. Then we also cooked these oysters. And of course, because they were fresh off the bag, people said that was their favorite mushroom that Sam cooked. Oh, you also made the shiitake mushroom gravy. Right. So we, we, you know, we were making this like an immersion experience. Um, and it, like I said, we also taught ID. Sam gave a talk. And then I also gave a talk on medicinal mushrooms. All right. Is that it? That's it. Okay. Unshare for now. So that, that was just, you know, one, that's stuff that we're doing, but that's stuff that we're doing because we have been in the club this long that we have, um, you know, learned how to do some of these presentations and also um, learned about what things people are interested in. And Cornelia had mentioned that we had done the weekend class back in 2019. And at least two of the people from that class have joined our club. And um, at least one of the persons from this past week class has joined our club. And speaking of joining our club is um, one of our guests who has been a speaker twice for our club. And um, in fact, she, it's Eleanor Shavit. She was our last in-person speaker in March of 2020. So that's the last in-person speaker we've had. And um, she, when they first came, when she first came to the talk to the club, she and her husband, Al, um, you know, we, they stayed with us and we went out to eat and did things. And she had some, um, she and I both had some nice observations about our club after actually doing our, their first talk to our club. And then she's joined our club and comes to many, many, many of our meetings. Do you know how to pin her? So Eleanor, okay. and so Eleanor, we asked and she was happy to um, talk about our club a little bit. So, and this is somebody who's been in mushroom clubs for over 40 years. Several different ones, president of the New York Mycological Society. You've been in the Boston, what else? You, well, let's we'll, let Eleanor we'll speak let Eleanor for herself. Speak, yeah, we spotlighted you, Eleanor. So it's actually, when I'm thinking of it, it's, uh, it is quite amazing. I joined the New York Mycological Society in 1986. So that's a while ago, isn't it? Wow. So uh, on a regular basis, I usually am a member of the New York club because that's, uh, that's my uh, uh, heart and soul kind of. Uh, the Connecticut Mycological Society because uh, the president then, uh, my good friend Sandy Shine said, well, if you become a member of COMA, I will become a member of the NIMS. And that's what happened. And of course, um, Boston, I live in Concord, which is close by. And so that makes sense. And then I met Cornelia and Sam in New York after, uh, I think Cornelia, I may correct. Did you give a talk or did I give a talk? I don't remember if someone gave a talk. No, that, I think that was me, but I'm not sure. I'm but not like, sure, if that, I don't remember. Yeah, it could have been. <laughs> we all done were, both, so I'm not sure which one it was. Yeah, and, and um, it may be me because I think afterwards you invited me to come and give that talk um, on the Bedouins, I don't remember. For, for the club and I came to your club. I think I gave a talk three times, not twice. And there is something about a mycological society that gives you a vibe immediately as you, uh, as you come in. Uh, and your club in particular was friendly, was uh, open armed, um, was excited, um, was interested. There's and there was this camaraderie and people join any club, not just the mycological club, but any club for a gazillions of reasons. Um, but it, um, I think that the mushroom club is special. Usually people come because they want to know more about where are the edible mushrooms that they can find and, uh, and what they can do with them. But uh, a real successful club does so much more than that. And, it, and a lot has to do with um, with the people who run the club versus the people who are members of the club and how it intermingles. 
And uh, in, when, when you have curiosity and your club, this is one of the things that caught me right away, this curiosity. So let's try and do uh, dyeing and let's try and see what we have in the woods and that we can make paper with. And, and uh, what are you making with this mushroom? Can you, can you cook it with, can, how do you cook that? And is this a medicinal? Why is it a medicinal mushroom? Let's see what we can, what we can do with it. Um, and, and, and the walks and the projects and uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a family, it becomes a family. I think that when I go back to 1986, some of my absolute best friends, friends for life um, uh, are from the Mycological Society. Um, mostly from the New York club and from Connecticut, but from Boston as well, and definitely in your club. And um, it, it, there's, then there is this important thing that I keep tooting, which is education. And I believe that uh, if we are to deal with, uh, with the climate warming, climate change, if we are to deal with uh, our environment going to uh, um, <laughs> in a hand basket, uh, we have to know more about all these things. And this is the job of a mycological society. And just look at some of your members and see how many interesting things they are interested in and how much they share. And it is all about sharing. And uh, we, when, when we, I, I have this dubious honor of being the last one to give a, uh, a live talk, but we are so fortunate to have Zoom because there's so much that we can do. In fact, in many ways, Zoom is opening uh, new, new doors for us that we are going to use after we go back to meeting uh, uh, together because it is so immediate and there's so much, so many things that we can do with it. And then let's not forget being members in a larger uh, organization such as the North American Mycological uh, uh, Association. And uh, it is it's always been my belief that in that organization, we have to be the liaison between the natural world and I just I don't think just mushrooms because mushrooms are not standalone without the trees without the plants they don't exist and vice versa. Um, we have to be the voice uh, in in the decisions that are made in Washington in in the decisions that are made in every in every state which is what for instance the North Northeast Mycological Federation used to do NIMF, uh, and definitely in Washington. And uh, we have so many people who can do that, who are, who are doing that, whether it is going and building something like iNatural or, uh, or um, in any of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the other projects such, such as that, um, that we just heard about that are so important um, and, and, and making sure that um, <laughs> if you want, the voice of fungi is heard. And uh, I came to your club and there is this special thing about it. You get together a lot. You, you do all of these cookouts and, and you walk and, 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 and you do the walks and, and there's, there's this camaraderie that is, um, um, it, it, you know, it, it really is unique. Uh, and you don't see it in too many of the clubs. It really is unique. And there's something and new, everything is happening. There's so many new things happening all the time. So I absolutely love coming to your club. Just invite me, I'll come again and again and again. And I don't care about uh, COVID. I think that uh, we will deal with that. Thank you, Eleanor. Um, oh, there's one last thing. Yes. Uh, fantastic fungi that True. I wanted. I actually thought that you guys were going to mention it. So well, we were so fortunate to get this movie succeed so well all over the world, not just in the United States, and if anyone is interested on the, between the 15th and the 17th of October, which is coming up, um, Fantastic Fungi has a free um, a talks and interviews by experts in so many fields um, <laughs> that anyone can actually join and listen to. And I encourage you to do, mm -hmm. uh, to do it and just choose the people that you find interesting. And I'm glad you're one of the people on it. Yeah. Well, so is, so is Bill actually. Bill Sheehan is also right. another person on there as well. And and we have the link to it in our newsletter. So it, that we just set out. We we had the, the little ad for the a fantastic fungi summit coming up. So no, but it's good that but, you mentioned that. But it's very good that you brought it up. I um, was actually curious to know how many people joined our club 
because of that movie. Like, and it, if you can raise your hand down there in the reaction thing, it'll actually pop you to the beginning of the screen and we can make it do a little head count. Or send it in the chat. You can, yeah. So anyway. Yes. So next we're, and you can keep doing this through the presentation. Just. Yep. So. Thank you, Eleanor. Yes. So what was the count? This is interesting. This really is interesting. I only see one person right now. Right. Although I don't have my whole gallery view. Because here we'll unspotlight you. Let's see. I can tell you from my own experience um, that I am getting now at least 20, 30 emails every single day from all over the world. All of them somehow originated with having seen this oh, movie. Yeah. And they start with, uh, I saw the movie and I didn't realize that. And here's a question. So uh, I'm so happy that it happened. Yes. That's great. And you, you, I think you knew Louis when he first started with this idea, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I and mean, he had gone through a lot of thinking on what to do and how to do it and eventually chose this particular uh, way and, um, and it worked out. He's also a right. fantastic photographer. I think that I've always loved to see slow motion, how a mushroom expands. Um, he has an eye. For, he's very, very talented, beautiful, beautiful movie. So now we're going to do a little more presentation, and then we've got an, another one of our club members um, who's going to be queued up to talk about their project. Oh, Jane. Jane was in our class at John C. Campbell. She just joined our meeting from Palm Desert, California. Okay. So Sam's sharing the screen. So Eleanor was talking about this. So one of the advantages of belonging to MCG is that you get a small discount on your membership to the North American Mycological Association, NAMA, which is the kind of national um, kind of clearinghouse organization for amateur clubs and amateurs. And it's been around since the 50s. And um, one of the things that's their mission is to hold a national foray every year, actually continental foray every year in a different location around the country. And um, I have been the foray committee chair for about seven years, six or seven years. And so um, wanted to just do a quick little um, run through. So the first NAMA that we attended was in 2011 in Clarion, Pennsylvania. And that's where we got to meet for the first time Gary Linkoff, the, the late but very great Gary Linkoff, who was the editor of the um, Audubon Guide and then wrote many other books. And he He um, was just an inspirational person, and we, it was great. This was our first foray, and we were driving up on the Thursday afternoon before we were going to check in to our college dormitory, and we saw this guy looking through the bushes and the ground at mushrooms, and Cornelia said, that's, that's Gary Linkoff. And so we stopped the car and said, hey, you're Gary, right? And we talked and he said, you want to go hunt mushrooms? So we, he got in our car and we drove to a little city park nearby. And we went out and found bunches of different mushrooms, had great conversations. We came back and, you know, checked into our room and put our displays out, specimens out. And over the next um, the next two days of the foray, as we're going out and finding things, in the evenings they would have the like find of the day, and they would give a little awards. And since we were really new at this, and this was our first national foray, Gary went out of his way. So one night 
he gave Cornelia an award for a mushroom he found, she found. And the next night he gave me an award for a mushroom that I found. And, you know, he would show the picture of it and explain what was special about it. And talk about being welcome and committed to, um, you know, this organization, just having that kind of welcome from him. And, and right next to him is Jay Justice, who we saw earlier at our Oconee pictures. And Jay was just getting an award from Gary. And we become good friends with both of them. We stayed with Gary in New York. And he came and spoke to our club two years in a row. And Jay's talked to our club. So going to these events is where you get to meet people. And so I'm going to do a real quick run through. I'm not going to do the, the boring travelogue thing, but I just want to do a run through so you get an idea of the kind of places where um, you are hunting mushrooms. So the one in Pennsylvania was in September. Then the next year we went to Scotts Valley, um, California in December. And then Jay hosted it in Arkansas in October. And, and we got to hang out with Eleanor and Ayel there. And we drove in a car together to a 4A site away from the camp, church camp where we were staying. Boy, there's stories about that. Um, but we get there, we open the door and within like 30 seconds, Eleanor's like, oh, here's a hen of the woods. And it was um, very illuminating for us. And then 2014 was near Mount Rainier. And boy, talk about like lush mushroom hunting. And one of the things we say is the Northwest has fewer species from uh, than we do but they have larger quantities of the species they have. And I remember I was driving with Eleanor and Ayel in, in Mount Rainier National Park, which they had gotten permission to hunt in. And we were driving along and I was looking up in the woods and I said to Eleanor, why are there so many fire hydrants just in the woods? <laughs> and it turns out that they were all lobster mushrooms, bright red lobster mushrooms that were easily a foot and a half tall. And I just had never seen that size and quantity before. And um, that year with Eleanor and Ayel, we were up at, at the National Park up at Paradise, which is one of the, the um, hiking sites. In, and we were having a little hot chocolate lunch and Paul Stamets walked in and Eleanor and Ayel have known Paul Stamets since the beginning, since he was a college student or just getting out of college. And so he sat down and he was supposed to have spoken in Asheville, North Carolina in 2014. And he had to cancel because that was right when his brother had passed away. So as we were sitting and talking with him, um, this was just the beginning of my becoming NAMA, um, NAMA 4A committee chair. And I had already arranged for NAMA to be in Black Mountain the next year. I just asked Paul, I said, oh, you know, we're so sorry that you had to cancel in Asheville this year. Is there any chance you would come to Asheville next year and be the keynote speaker for our 4A? And you can also give your other talks to just the Nashville, Asheville area, because he was also going to talk to the beekeepers. And so we were able to arrange for the 2015 foray in Black Mountain to have Paul Stamets be the keynote speaker. And it was really great. And this was a foray to remember, not just because Paul was there, but also because it had been dry for two to three weeks before the foray. And then starting on Thursday, it just started pouring rain and it poured rain the entire weekend. Um, we still got out there, we still found specimens, but it, it just every foray is different. 2016 was also in the mid-Atlantic area in Virginia. We got to go hunt in um, the Shenandoah National Park. 2016 was in Cable, Wisconsin, up in the north. And I think that was one of the um, forays that ended up with the most identified species. I think it was over, I think it was over 500. 
and it was beautiful hunting up there. And Britt Bunyard, who is the um, founder, editor, publisher of Fungi Magazine, he actually hosts every year now up in Cable, Wisconsin, the Northwoods Foray. So that's something you can look at attending. And then 2018, we <laughs> held it in Salem, Oregon. Um, it was interesting location, kind of fun. And then 2019 was held at Paul Smith's College in the Adirondacks of New York. And Eleanor was a speaker. We had a great time, um, beautiful hunting in the woods. And then we had to skip 2020, but this year we were able to do it out in Granby, Colorado. Some of our members attended and it, um, it was really good. We had 250 people come to the foray. And due to the, um, our policies and the policies of the resort where we were, we had to take everyone's temperature. If you had to show your vaccinated nation card, if you were not vaccinated, you had to show a negative test, COVID test taken within the last 72 hours. And we are also fortunate that the office of the resort had the, um, the quick test so that some people could get tested and we just had a really great time and it it was up so granby is up near um, mount the rocky mountain national park up in the front range up in the mountains and they just started getting rain like a week to two weeks beforehand and so there were king bolites the porcini that were 10 or 11 inches across in their cap and, and now we're gonna have a presentation by Will Beeson, who is a graduate student at Kennesaw State University. And if you visit their website, you can watch this video about what, what they are, what he is doing there. So Will, we got you set up, you're a co-host. So anytime you're ready to um, share your screen, we're ready for you and and right thank you very much uh thanks everybody for your time it's a real privilege to get to talk about this so as uh sam mentioned i'm a master's student at kennesaw state university in the integrative biology program and my research is focused on mushroom cultivation and specifically on how we can make that happen in a more environmentally sustainable fashion and just to give some context for how I'm coming about this and really the context of mushroom cultivation in general, I want to give a brief overview of the history of mushroom cultivation. And I want to focus on the growth substrates used, which is what we grow mushrooms on. That's also what they eat and the types of environments in which those mushrooms were grown. So does anybody want to guess just think about it to yourself. What the first record, recorded cultivated mushroom is. Uh, it's one of my favorites. It's something that you can find all around the uh, Georgia area pretty much all year round as long as there's a rainstorm. Give you a hint. You can actually kind of see it in the citation there, but it says the Whittier mushroom. How oh, cool. It's a uh, first recorded cultivation was around 600 AD in logs in a forest. So in its natural habitat. And it wasn't for a little while till we got the next one, but it's the rising star on the global market. One of the most popular mushrooms out there. You know it, you love it. It's shiitake mushrooms. Uh, but despite there being uh, about 500 years of history between these two, we're still doing it at logs in a forest. Now, there is some evidence that at this time, the method of inoculation and the ways that the uh, logs were placed, became a little bit more intentional, a little bit more sophisticated. The original cultivation methods were really less cultivation and more uh, finding a tree that had wood ears growing on it, cutting it down, and then coming back later to get more, and then putting new logs next to it to get more. Eventually, you do start to get something that you see today still, which is the cutting down intentionally chosen trees and inoculating them with uh, sawdust from a previously inoculated tree. And next up though, this is the one that we all see in the stores, button mushroom. 
And really the big breakthrough here is that we eventually began growing these in caves and on compost from farms. So one thing I wanna point out is that we're originally talking about mushrooms like wood ears and shiitakes being grown on timber. And although early cultivation methods, as I mentioned, were on previously or already infected trees, uh, eventually you do get to a point where you're using intentionally cut down trees for food and not for building materials. Uh, however, here, the bud mushrooms, we're using compost from farming activities. And although there would have been a lot of use for compost, retilling it back into your soil, there's probably more than enough to go around. And it's really not until very, very recently that we get the more modern iteration of mushroom cultivation. We get the synthetic logs. And uh, the first version of this was on shiitake mushrooms, but very, very rapidly, this began to be applied to many other species. So this is on sawdust, and this is performed indoors in a controlled environment. The re really the big thing here that I want to point out is that sawdust is a waste product, totally a waste product. Uh, nowadays, we can't use it for things like oak pellets for your smoker or heating, but for the most part, this is a byproduct of the timber industry that has little use. And in this case, we're also growing it indoors, so we're no longer subject to the environmental shifts of, you know, if it rains, if it's a hot day, a dry day, anything like that, we're controlling all of these parameters. To continue with that idea, I want to talk about the growing environment that we use down at Kennesaw State University. I think it's really exciting. It's what drew me there. It's what I think is really unique. Uh, we, fo we focus on this idea of controlled environment agriculture. And what that means is that we, the growers, take full control of all variables relevant to the growth of our fungi. This is typically associated with modern commercial hydroponic plant growers, but we're applying the same principles to mushroom cultivation. So on the left, you can see here our prototype chamber. So this is our controlled environment that we use for, uh, or for growing and fruiting mushrooms for small laboratory scale grows. We're gonna test something out. But here's the, re here's the real deal. Uh, we have a shipping container 20 feet long that's been converted into a, grow a growing and fruiting chamber. And here we have sensors and controllers outfitted for regulating temperature, humidity, carbon dioxide levels, and light exposure. Bearded man that you see in both pictures, that's actually an alumnus of the Mushroom Club of Georgia. That's Daniel Reiner. Some of you may have met him and some of you may see him again. Uh, he pioneered a lot of this work and I'm very thankful for his contributions to the project. And so now that we've talked a little bit about where we're gonna be growing the mushrooms, we're gonna talk about what we'll be growing them on. But to do that, I wanna give a brief anecdote from history. So I found a publication from the USDA on mushroom cultivation in 1897. And in that publication, they make note of one substance that is said to have been the best fertilizer for mushroom growers. You think for a minute about what you think it might be. Give you a hint. Here we go. It's a uh, it's horse manure. So button mushrooms, which were the uh, largest produced mushroom at the time, and in the U.S. they still are. They love horse manure. A particular horse uh, horse manure comes from horse bedding, which is mixed with straw and other uh, cereal byproducts. And just to kind of give us some context here, in 1897, how much horse manure was there in the United States? So I had to go digging through a few sources to get this estimate. I found that it's, it's got to be over 195 million tons per year in the U.S. alone. And again, although there are uses for that in, in uh, conventional agriculture, I doubt that we tilled all of that back into the soil. So not only was this a high quality substrate for mushroom cultivation, but it was highly abundant. Uh, I could hardly imagine you finding uh, town in America at the turn of century that was low on horse manure. Now, thinking about this idea, I want everybody to take a second to guess, what do you think is the number one crop commodity in the state of Georgia? It's the thing that's the number one by volume and by value that we grow in the state of Georgia. It's cotton. I know everyone wants to say peanuts, pecans, or peaches, but it's cotton. 
of acres and acres of it by far, there's so much cotton in Georgia. And when all of these acres are harvested, you can kind of see this here in the picture, all of that other plant material gets caught up in the, uh, in the harvesters, in the combines, and it needs to be separated before the cotton can be spun. So those nice white fibers that you see here, they get mixed in with all those dried leaves and twigs and seeds and seed hulls, all that kind of crud. In the process of separating the cotton fiber, which we use to make clothing, everything else is called ginning. And when you gin the cotton, you get cotton fiber, and you get one other thing, cotton gin trash. Literally, the industry term for this stuff is trash, cotton gin trash. Georgia is the number two cotton producer in America by a fairly wide margin. Texas is number one, and we're not very far behind them. And by my estimate, the ginning process in Georgia generates about 205 and a half million pounds of waste every year. And removing that waste from the premises of ginning operations is very difficult, not just because of its sheer volume, but there is a lot of it and it's quite costly to move. They, they literally need to ship it by the train car load, uh, but there's really not that many uses for it. It's being peddled as a roughage for cattle and cattle feed, uh, but from anecdotal evidence from talking to farmers, some research that I've been reading, it's very subpar for that use even. Uh, but it turns out this cotton gin trash is uh, actually enriched in the types of nutrients that some mushrooms love to grow on. In particular, cotton is primarily made up of cellulose. And as you can see here in this picture on the right, there's actually quite a bit of cotton fiber still caught up in the cotton gin trash. It's very difficult to separate out 100% of the cotton, so you end up with a significant amount of cotton in the gin cotton gin trash. So cellulose, the main constituent of, carb, of cotton, is, a, is pretty much nearly universally loved by a lot of the mushrooms that we know how to cultivate. And on top of that, the cotton gin trash is mixed in with a bunch of seed holes and other plant material that allows for the substrate to be enriched with nitrogen and you don't have to add anything else to it. Uh, on top of that, there are some good physical characteristics of the cotton gin trash. You can see here, it's not very dense. And it's actually very non-homogeneous. Uh, anyone who's tried to grow things on a sawdust block at home, you know that sometimes if it's too thick, you could get the, uh, the center to rot out because there's not a lot of gas exchange happening. Uh, you don't get oxygen in the center and your mycelium dies. And they're not very happy, but you don't tend to have that problem with cotton gin trash. So the paddy straw mushroom, as it turns out, it grows like gangbusters on cotton gin trash. The name paddy straw originally comes from the traditional substrate that it was grown on, which was rice straw. And since we grow rice and rice patties, it, it ended up coming up with the name paddy straw. So that a special Latin name we give it is Bulbariella pulvaceae, and that's because it grows in a cup, similar to what you might see with an amanita. Uh, that's actually why this mushroom is one of the number one accidental poisoning mushrooms in the US, Canada, and Australia, because the paddy straw mushroom grows very widely throughout South, Southeast Asia, and there are not nearly as many poisonous amanita species over there. The people who grow up knowing that the paddy straw mushroom is out there and it's delicious, come abroad and they misidentify an amanita as a paddy straw mushroom and end up going to the hospital. It's very tragic, but this is a good plug for always ID your mushrooms. And as mentioned before by Sam, don't assume that it's the same mushroom just because it looks the same. If you're in a different country, it's probably something different. So the story I want to tell real quickly about paddy straw is that about four decades ago, cultivators of paddy straw were cultivating it on the traditional rice straw based substrate. And they used cotton gin trash one day to provide insulation to those beds in between flushes and croppings. Uh, they thought they were just gonna save themselves some, uh, some money on the heating bill during the winter. But it turns out the mycelium colonized the cotton gin trash and it gave even better yields than the rice straw alone. Since then, cotton gin trash has become the standard go-to substrate for commercial cultivation of this mushroom, uh, at least in parts of China and 
uh, other areas in Southeast Asia. Uh, it, it's typically cultivated in rural settings in tropical areas. But I think the unique sort of nation, the, the unique story of this mushroom is very appealing to me. And as some of you may have noticed, it's not available in the US. This is because the mushroom after harvest tends to liquefy in about two days and particularly uh, fast under refrigeration. So it is one of the few commodities that we know how to grow, but it will not survive shipping across an ocean. In addition to that, the temperature requirements, because it's, na uh, it's naturally found in the tropics, are quite high. So although you can grow it seasonally here in the state of Georgia, it's not something that could be grown year round outdoors. So I think that this means that this mushroom lends itself particularly well to this controlled environment approach. Um, we have no shortage of cotton gin trash. We have an environment in which we can grow at the temperature that it's used to growing in nature. And there's no fresh mushrooms for it in the, in the United States. You can't find it. You can find it dried, you can find it canned, but unless you grow it yourself, you're not gonna get them. So in order to bring this to the forefront, I bring this to the people, I would love to be able to grow this. In my, in my experience, we've been having some difficulty with laboratory uh, sterile cultivation of this mushroom. This is typically grown in rural settings in less than sterile conditions. But if anybody has any experience growing this mushroom at home, I would love to, love to pick your brain. This is not the only mushroom that I'm interested in working with though. There's a whole number of species that I'm interested in. And this is not even an exhaustive list, but a close relative is the silky rosegill of Alvariella bombacina. This mushroom grows on an even wider variety of substrates and in a wider variety of environments. It's been found all over the world. The chestnut mushroom, no, not that chestnut, not that one, not that one either. There's at least four different mushrooms called chestnut, talking about the foliota mushroom here. A delicious mushroom. You can find it in some markets around here, uh, like farmer's markets or some specialty markets, but it's very, very rare, very expensive. So I would love to start bringing that out to the people. Enochia mushroom, much more commonly found in market, uh, at store, but they're all currently imported. And because we have the capacity to grow them all here, there's plenty of agricultural waste products upon which we can grow them. I see no reason why we can't grow this here in Georgia and have some local enoki. Lion's mane, uh, many of you may have heard about this mushroom. It's very popular. You can find it in some stores or uh, in some markets, but it's so, the demand for it is so high right now that none of the growers that I've spoken with in the state of Georgia are able to meet that demand with the current supply they have. So I'm hoping to expand the portfolio of substrates that this mushroom can be grown upon and hopefully we can start seeing more of it. One last one. Technically, this one is not being grown by me. This one is being grown by someone in my lab that I work with, who's actually a new member of the Georgia Mushroom Club himself, Mark Sheehan. It's the Veiled Lady Mushroom. This one, I am really excited to see what he could do with. This mushroom has been cultivated under controlled conditions since I think the late 90s. It's very, very difficult to find information about it because it is a very, very valuable mushroom. And so I don't think that people are interested in sharing their secrets with the world. But this mushroom is very unique in that it is typically found growing in bamboo forests, bamboo notoriously rot resistant, but this thing grows in the forest and not in an ectomycorrhizal relationship. It grows on the leaf litter and on dead bamboo shoots. Uh, he's actually working on this with a lab to study the shape of that veil, get some 3D imaging done, because there's some interest from groups like NASA to study the energetics of how it's formed, the physical properties of it. But frankly, Mark and I are really just interested in tasting this thing. It's worth hundreds of dollars. We gotta know what it's like. And I have to thank, of course, my PI, Dr. Cornelison, and the Bioinnovation Laboratory's postdoctoral researcher, Dr. Pau Gabriel. He is actually the one responsible for the controlled environment chambers. He programmed all of the software for it. He built that large shipping, the 20 foot long shipping container one. And he's really been like the brains behind all of that infrastructure. I can't thank him enough. 
I also have to thank, of course, the funding resources that I receive money from the Georgia Research Alliance, the Georgia Department of Agriculture. Thanks to a recent grant that we were awarded from them, we are able to now partner with four mushroom cultivators around the state of Georgia. We're going to be fabricating 40 foot long shipping containers with the controlled environment systems embedded, place them at their locations and helping train them to use them and helping to expand the portfolio of mushrooms that they can grow. Uh, we really don't see any reason why Georgia can't be a place where specialty mushrooms are grown all year round and available in many places. With that, I thank you all for your time and I hand everything back over to Sam. Thank you, Will. And we've got, Cornelia's got a question. You said you had a question. I have a ton of questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will say a little fun anecdote is that the Indusiatus, they sell it dried in Asian stores. And I had actually had it at Harmony, which is a vegetarian restaurant, Chinese vegetarian Buddhist restaurant in town. So I'd had it and they periodically would put it on the menu. And so we were with Gary Linkoff in New York City at a Chinese restaurant and I saw it on the menu and I said, oh, I love this one. And, and uh, or I asked Gary if he'd eaten. He says, oh, I didn't really like it. You know, and I was like, okay, but I like it. So I'm going to order it. And um, he thought it was delicious. Apparently he had a different preparation. And um, so he said that every time they would do a walk at the, was this near the Botanic, which Brooklyn, I think we were at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, but every time they do a walk, they'd go to this restaurant and he'd make sure everybody got to taste the mushroom. It's got a really fun, crunchy texture, delicious. So that's really yeah, cool I, that you have somebody that's figuring that out. Yeah, I'm really excited to see it. I mean, for one, just to get like watch it, we're, we want to get some good time lapse photos of the veil actually awesome. forming. We want to at least you know have some specimens left over to try. I also need to send you a picture of my costume from Telluride because that's what I dressed she up was, as. She was Lady Indusiatus. 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 Um, and I I followed behind <clears throat> with a hat with a bunch of flies floating off the hat. Um, so one thing, Will, while we're getting ready to do some more talking, is if you could put in the chat, there was a link to the article that talked about you all getting the grant and everything that had the link to your vid that video. If you could put that in the chat so that people could copy it and, and watch that little video. And, and I think it's really cool that you're like working on that growing environment and you know, getting that sent to people so that they can use that for their, you know, their business and stuff too. It's it's, you know, it's it's not just teaching people how to grow mushrooms, but also creating an environment where they can do their own experimentation. Yeah, I, you know, one thing that we've already noticed talking to growers even before this started is that a lot of them are set up to grow oysters and shiitakes, and I love oysters and shiitakes. Don't get me wrong, but that's kind of all they have the capacity to do. If they are interested, they really want to do some of these other varieties like golden oysters and pink oysters or some uh, other like warm fruiting mushrooms that they can't do because that would necessitate shutting down or like completely stopping production on everything else because they only have, you know, one or two chambers or they don't, they don't have the ability to have multiple temperature regimes right. on at once. And Michael Fletcher is suggesting if you have any social media connections to post it here in the chat for us. Um, I don't know if you've done that with your research or not, but. I have know. not. I, I have friends who, who pressure me to do it. I, I probably will at some point because it'd be good to have a portfolio. Yeah. Well, yeah, definitely. So we visited some growers, uh, different growers than you in Mississippi, and he had a big dome growing in all. And he had all the different lights, colored lights doing. Is that something that's incorporated in your growth chambers at all? And, and what do you think about that? At the moment, no. We do have uh, in, the lab, in our lab lab, we have, a, we have a grow tent that um, what our postdoc has done a lot of work with plants with that will do specific wavelengths of light. So we 
have the interest in doing some research with that, in particular uh, with cordyceps, because they're kind of unique in that cordyceps militaris, the fruiting requirements are mostly light. And yet we can't find research that says, you know, this wavelength specifically is, is ideal. But it seems kind of obvious that it, it, should, it should be there. There should be an optimal wavelength, especially since with oyster mushrooms, we have a lot of information that links like, you know, blue light to certain uh, fruiting patterns. Cool. Well, if people have any further questions, put them in the chat and you can send them straight to Will or you can send them to everyone. And, and um, But thank you, Will. That was a great presentation and we're happy you are part of our club. And, um, you know, maybe there's some way that you can help get our club involved, you know, as a support for you. And in our conversation just the other night, I would like to suggest for anyone, if you're out and you find some wild enoki, oh, that's right. That's something that Will would love to have some tissue samples of, you know, and some um, as fresh as possible specimens, because right now they're just working on the cultivated ones. And well, this is a good question. Jimmy has posted in the chat here. He's wanting to know how he can get his hands on cotton gin trash at the consumer level. So yeah. that's a difficult question because at the consumer level, uh, there. okay, so our, our experience has been that there are some cotton ginners that we talk to who literally will say, yeah, just come by, like and take it out of the pile. They'll literally just have a pile outside of their operation or they, or they might have a train car and they'll say, yeah, do you want two train cars? And we have to say, no, we have a truck. Uh, you can purchase pelleted gin trash. I think you typically need to purchase it in very large quantities, but you might be able to get them to send you samples in like, you know, 20 to 50 pound buckets. That's kind of what we've had some success with. Uh, otherwise, yeah, I, I would just like literally, uh, let me see if I can find it, but like you, you just Google Cotton Ginners, Georgia. And then if you reach out to them and say, hey, can I come by and take some, they'll probably be like, yeah, whatever. Right. And someone's asking about your email, if you can go ahead and post it in the chat. Um, and I know we, we said, I, I haven't, I did have two other questions. So one was, did the newer patty strains work any better? You were getting a, a different strain? Yeah. So we got two, two new strains and we've, we, we got a, a, like transferred until we got clean cultures and we've had to put that on ice for a minute while we work on some other stuff because it requires us to, I, I know I was just saying that like the, the, the shipping container gives us so much more versatility, but since we've only got the two, uh, they're both in use right now. I have to wait until they're done so I can crank right. up the heat. Uh, we are working on the Bombacina, the, ro the Silky Rosegill. I'm a lot more, uh, every time that I say that I'm like optimistic about this time, it doesn't work. So I'm not gonna say that I'm optimistic about it, but the literature suggests that this mushroom is a lot easier to fruit under laboratory conditions. Oh, and cool. it should produce on a much wider variety of substrates. Um, the standard patty straw mushroom does not like lignin and hemicellulose. It's pretty, so that's why cotton gin trash in particular is really good for it. It's mostly the cellulose it's eating, does not like hardwood sawdust. Silky Rosegill, also called the tree mushroom, loves sawdust, loves cotton, loves wheat straw, et cetera. It, it, it grows all over the place. Um, right. A lot of these mushrooms that I'm interested in growing, I found through looking at research that's being published in developing countries and in uh, places where rural like subsistence farming is still widespread. And they found things that, hey, you can grow this on waste product from your own farm yes. and it will supplement your nutrients. It will supplement your income. Right. And it gets rid of a lot of this waste that otherwise either piles up, gets burned, or you have to get pay someone to get rid of. That's wonderful. Okay, we Great. need to move on. Oh, we need to move on. Okay, but yes. Thank Great, you. thank you so much, Will. That was awesome. So I've got, Rod, I've got another five or 10 minutes and then we're gonna go to you. Okay. So we just wanted to talk a little bit about also what we offer. 
and have offered in the past and are planning to offer again in the future. So we have done dyeing wool and silk with mushrooms. We've done a couple workshops of those. Um, we've done tree identification walks because it's really good to know your trees because it helps you know what grows with it and what grows on it. And we've had weekend mushroom identification skills building workshops where we, we had Arlene and Alan Bissett who are authors of many mushroom books. They led a weekend long, a all day Saturday and half a day Sunday um, workshop where we would go, they would talk a little bit, we'd go out, hunt in the woods, bring back mushrooms, and then they would help us identify them and help us learn how to identify them. That was really great. We've done photography workshops with um, Todd Elliott and other people who have been photographers in our club. We have done a couple culinary tasting and cooking classes. We wanna keep doing more of those. We've done liquid cultivation workshops where we had um, Peter, Peter McCoy of Radical Mycology come and teach us how to like do your own um, pressure jars that pressure can. pressure can jars very easily. And then we've also done, we try to do every year, uh, field trips to Mushroom Mountain um, in East East South Carolina. And we might still want do one later this year, but if not, we'll be doing one um, next year. And we've also in collaboration done a paper making workshops with the Robert C. Williams Paper Museum at Georgia Tech. And one of the things we did one time, which I want to do again, is the Saturday Science Seminar at the Georgia Gwinnett College with the help from Dr. Melissa Caspery, who's an associate professor there, is we had a Saturday, um, she had a, a lecture hall and we had three different um, speakers do talks on different aspects of mushrooms. And one is a friend of ours, um, Zach Chavez from the Massachusetts, now New York area, who's been working on um, exploring the history of George Washington Carver's um, mycological studies. And that was a really great talk. And so we, we've been doing a lot of fun stuff. And we've also done other events where M MCG members have participated and helped us with either a booth or a table. Fernbank Museum had a poisons exhibition about five years ago or so. And they did a one day kind of expo thing in their big lobby where the mushroom club had a couple tables and um, displays about poisonous mushrooms. And the uh, Chattahoochee Nature Center, they hold a, like a spring festival every year. And we've had tables and booths and little tents there at least twice. And um, the George, the annual meeting of the Georgia Native Plant Society, Society down in Macon every spring, we've often come and set up a table there and, and provided information to people. And of course, the Georgia Mushroom Festival in Cave Spring, Georgia, which was founded by one of our members, Claudia Luttrell. I think this, this year was like the fifth year. And um, we always go and have a table and then I run the speakers part of, of their program and it's a really great event and it's been growing every year. And one of the things Cornelia has not done for our club yet, but has done is doing a felting workshop. And so here's grandma and granddaughter. And these were just blank pillows that we brought and they, we had designs, Cornelia had designs that they could use and then the felt and the felting needles. And they did this in what, three hours? Yeah. So that's one thing we want to do um, sometime when, you know, the mushrooming is not really great. Let's do a fun art project. And our potlucks have been legendary. And we've held a holiday potluck in December for many years. We used to go to a little restaurant, um, but we found it more fun to do the potlucks. And our club member, Catherine Geyer, former caterer does, does a professional job of organizing and running the potluck. And so here are some of the folks hanging around. And we also have speakers from all over the country come and talk at our monthly meetings. Um, not in person right now, but we're gonna continue. 
And here's another shot of the potluck. Here's, you know, get a load of that buffet. And Rod, who's going to be talking next, who's our vice president, he baked this cake and then he made all these mushrooms out of meringue. So the food is fabulous. So um, that's all for me. And we like Rod to do his presentation and um, then we'll end, finish with some questions. And also we were gonna invite people who've been members for a while to go ahead um, after Rod's talk um, to uh, unmute themselves. And if they want to um, spend a minute or two talking about what they've gotten out of joining, being part of the club, that would be great. So now we're waiting for Rod to get it all up. All righty, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Um, you see the picture of the phone book? Yes, we see that picture okay. of the phone book. It looks great. So uh, when Sam was talking in the beginning about workshops, it reminded me of this about 10 years ago, uh, I did a workshop on recyclable materials and we had all these phone books in the in the neighborhood. And I thought, well, let's just eat them or a mushroom phone. And that particular weekend, one of my neighbors was having a, a birthday party. And I took this over to the party. There was about 40 people there. And his grandmother was on the front porch, this 94 year old woman. And I left this sitting out on the porch. And when I walked by at one point, I overheard her say, she said, you know, I've seen a lot of things over the year, but I think that's the strangest cake I've ever seen. I'll never forget that. <laughs> anyway, if I have about five minutes to go over a short introduction on something that I've been doing the past, well, kind of semi-professional for the past year, which is skincare with medicinal mushrooms. And I just want to share a few things that I encountered uh, in my research. Um, I'm talking to you uh, basically as a biochemist by training. I was a resident chemist for the first part of my career. And uh, I had built some labs in Pennsylvania and Florida and one of the first labs that I ever worked in, I got to spend with a, a share space with a cosmetics lab. And I got to meet a man named Dr. Peter Police, who was a world renowned leader in Alaskan history. And it really got me interested in uh, uh, cosmetic chemistry. And I've basically been making products for going on close to 40 years. Um, but as far as mushrooms go, I've only been doing that for the past few years. The research is, is starting to really ramp up. Uh, mushroom extracts in formulations are, they're, they're competitively effective. Uh, there have been many synthetic compounds available over the years, some really good stuff, and they come out all the time. But a lot of the mushroom extracts that you can make, uh, because these things are not available that I've ever seen to, to purchase, but you can make them at home and uh, they're, they're, they're almost, in some cases, they're more effective than the stuff that you can buy. Um, in, op, in, op, in many cases, there's lower or no toxicity. For example, one of the big uh, draws in skincare is skin lightening products or skin brightening products, things to take away uh, age spots or freckles or things of that nature. Hydroquinone is a, is a very common compound that's used in skincare products. It's actually regulated because of its toxicity. But there are uh, mushroom equivalents that are uh, more effective than that, more effective than arbutin, which is a plant product from uh, the bearberry family. And if I have time, I can go into that a little bit more about you know, skin and um, And they're easy to use. Uh, one of the beauty one of the nice things about mushroom extracts is you don't need any uh, harsh chemical. Uh, you can get everything you need using either ethanol or water. Uh, usually you use a combination of the two to broaden your, your polarity spectrum in your extraction, but almost everybody has access to those. those well, everybody has access to water. 
but uh, ethanol is, is really all you need. And then there is an issue about wide spectrum versus standardized compounds. And uh, all of the products that you can make at home are going to be wide spectrum. And to better understand this, you can use this as an example. Uh, what I mean between the difference between standardized and wide spectrum is if, if you look at, uh, and this is a little bit of a diversion, it's not skin care. This would be like an oral consumption for controlling cholesterol. The statin drugs uh, were originally uh, developed, they, they were found in, in mushrooms. And Barotis, this oyster mushroom, uh, is a natural source of lobostatin. It's about 2.8% by dry weight. Uh, but you can, you, and the lobostatin that's available as a, as a prescription drug is not extracted from mushrooms. It's, it's created synthetically. But uh, when you're talking about a mushroom-derived product or a mushroom compound, lobostatin itself would be a standardized compound. Wide spectrum would be everything else that's in there. So, for, for example, people who suffer from uh, liver problems or liver disease or kidney issues cannot take lobostatin, or it's not recommended that they do. However, I don't know of any restrictions on them eating oyster mushrooms. In fact, it's my understanding that oyster mushrooms are, are beneficial for your liver. So it's an interesting thing. So you leave it to yourself as to whether or not uh, the advantage of standardized is you know exactly how much you can. You're not going to know that with a oyster mushroom because of the variability. Um, so I just want to share with you some highlights of things that I've uh, that I've just been interested in with uh, mushroom extracts as a skincare product. And one of the things is their potential to hydrate or moisturize the skin. Uh, what you're looking at here is. Uh, something called Tremella fusiformis polysaccharide. This is a polysaccharide that's extracted from a uh, white jelly fungus. It has the ability to uh, absorb 400 times its weight in water, which is kind of what I'm trying to show with this animation. Uh, this would be a similar or a, a, a substitute for if you've heard of hyaluronic acid, which the body produces naturally, but it's used in a lot of commercial skincare products. It's, a, it's an extraordinarily large molecule. And uh, one can only start to wonder, well, how does, how does this actually work in the, in the context of topical skin? I mean, does it just sit on the surface and form a film or does it actually penetrate? And for that matter, how does anything penetrate the skin? I mean, most people think of the skin as an impermeable barrier. And it is water. So, what you need to do is uh, understand the concept of skin penetration with these molecules. We have something called the Dalton. Daltons are a unit of measurement of how large molecules are. And uh, typically, the Dalton rule states that a molecule that's under 500 Dalton can pass through the skin uh, given the right solvent. And in that case, the solvent is typically a carrier. Water does not make a good solvent because of the uh, hydrophobic nature of the skin. This compound, however, is much greater than 500 dollars. In fact, it's uh, several thousand dollars. So does it actually get through the skin? Well, studies have shown that it does. Uh, it's very interesting to know that the epidermis of your skin, this molecule has the ability to literally fold between the, the keratin sites of the cells and enter into, into your skin get your hydration effects out. Moisture and hydration of the skin, the water does not come externally. It's all created from income. So even if this compound were to sit on the surface of your skin as a, as a film, as a barrier, it's actually quite beneficial because it's preventing something called trans-epidermal water loss, which is your skin naturally loses water. And I'm not talking about perspiration or you know, sweat of that nature, but just it naturally loses water quite a bit throughout the day. So by retaining that water and keeping it in the in the skin in both ways, the epidermis and the dermis, they're going to have much healthier skin. Uh, and getting back to the, the Dalton rule and, and smaller molecules takes me to my next topic, which is uh, antioxidants, which I believe are the most, probably the most useful component of mushroom extracts. 
the, the previous molecule, the polysaccharide, is, is the water soluble. You would extract that with just pure water. Antioxidants, however, are, are typically phenolic compounds, which are soluble in a, a slightly less polar environment, typically uh, ethanol. And uh, they're smaller in weight, and they are very effective. The problem is uh, they don't last very long. You think of like you know, fruit, or you hear about things that are antioxidants. You know, you start to blueberries, different types of berries and fruit. Antioxidant, a really good antioxidant will oxidize very quickly. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean that it is it is uh, sequestering or using up uh, free oxygen. So another analogy would be like your car. The paint on your car is, is a crude form of a antioxidant. Without it, the oxygen would rust the car, it would oxidize to the metal. So one of the challenges that I've had with uh, skincare products with uh, mushroom extracts is how do you keep them fresh? And uh, you know, you look at commercial products and you see the, the large amount of compounds that are in there, but the ingredients list are enormous sometimes. Some of that is for proprietary means for marketing, maintain a hold on a certain formulation. But a lot of it is to stabilize the product, to give it a long shelf life. So the stuff that I make, uh, you have to use it within uh, a few months. You just simply do. And if you don't, if, you, if you're hoarding it or not using it, you're not doing yourself any favor. So a lot of the stuff that you might be buying that has antioxidants in it, uh, they're probably not as effective as, as you think they might be. Um, move on to one more topic here, which is uh, skin lightening. Skin lightening is a process where uh, you basically want to control dark or discoloration or, or hyperpigmentation of the skin. And you do that by uh, controlling a rate limiting enzyme, which is called tyrosine. I, the skin lightening claims that I've seen are, are elusive at best, because I mean, in reality, if there were a really good way to do it, everybody would know about it and be using it. The, the interesting thing is the test for uh, tyrosinase activity is based on a enzyme that comes from mushrooms. So, and we do that in vitro, meaning it's not done in the body, it's done usually inside of the petri dishes. And the, uh, the test uses a mushroom tyrosinase. So when you hear that something is a skin lightening product, chances are it's really good at controlling melanin in mushrooms, but not necessarily in humans, because human tyrosinase and mushroom tyrosinase are structurally very different. In fact, the active uh, area of the enzyme itself, the tyrosinase enzyme, there's there's key differences between mushroom and human tyrosine. So it's kind of ironic that you would say these mushrooms are good for skin lightening using a test that's using mushroom tyrosinase. They're very good for, for or, or they're rare, they're better at minimizing tyrosinase production in mushrooms than they and to wrap things up, because I'm rushing here, because I know that we're really short on time. But I just want to go over some reasons as to why why would you bother to make these products at home? I started doing it long ago to save money. I mean, I can I can see a product on the shelf that runs two three hundred dollars an ounce that I can easily make for um, ninety five percent. I've been doing that for a long time. It's amazing what the markup is. So saving money is, is one reason. Uh, potency is another issue. I mean, just because a product that you buy commercially says it has something in it, there's no guarantee that it's really good. So in this case, when you make your own thing, you can make it as, as potent as you want. I mean, you can make it upwards of 90% uh, of the active ingredient, the, the extract itself. Safety is another issue. Um, some of these compounds are not terribly safe that you find in the commercial. Some of the uh, preservatives, for example, or you know, certain people have issues with uh, sensitivity to things like parabens and things like that. So you can control what goes in. And everything I make, as a rule of thumb, if I can't eat it, I usually don't put it in a 
skin care product because, you know, especially something that's going on your lips or near your eye, you would want a product that is safe to ingest if you can and with mushroom extract. Uh, well, there's two more here. There's authenticity and customization. Authenticity meaning if you're going to use a product that has a uh, extract in it, if you make it yourself, you know exactly where it's made. So if, if you buy something off the you know, commercially and it says it's made with a shiitake or a ganoderma, you may not you may not be using an extract that's the fruiting box, for instance, where maybe certain compounds express themselves greater than they would with a chili extract. You control uh, the source, you have control over what you're extracting. So and customization is the last reason, which would be, you know, some people, cosmetics, a, a lot of cosmetics is just about looking good. You want something that feels good, makes you look good. And people have different preferences, you know, different carrier oils or different, uh, different types of penetration uh, reagents. You, you can customize all that yourself. So there's a lot of advantage to doing this yourself. And on that note, because I've gone way over, I will Thank you, Rod. Yep, thanks, Rod. That was, and that's always such a great picture. 